peace. And so then they'll be doing what verse 14 says, follow peace with all men. They are making peace. Not man to man, but man to God. They are having these people who are subject to God's wrath that are going to receive God's wrath at the end of the tribulation period, but then they believe the gospel of the kingdom, so now they don't get the wrath, and they have peace with God. Romans 5.1 says for us today, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the peace that's everlasting, that's, that counts, is the peace with God. And so he says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So if they don't have peace with God, they're not even going to see the Lord. He'll just, he'll just zap them and they're dead. And then he'll end up throwing them into the lake of fire. Okay, verse 15 then. Now we have, so we've got a progression here. First they're saved, uh, verse 12. Then they help other people, verse 13. Now they're proclaiming the gospel of peace in verse 14. And now verse 15, we're talking about what happens among the little flock, among the group of believers. Because then it's easy to have some kind of flesh contest there. And that's what he's talking about. Verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Um, so, bitterness, I wrote on your outline, bitterness is the flesh's response to a demonstration of God's grace. Because it said there in verse 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. It's God's, here are a bunch of people who are doomed to have wrath with God, and instead they proclaim peace. So now they go from God's wrath to a time of peace with God, eternal peace with God. And so, for God to bring you from wrath to peace, that's God's grace. Giving you the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23 says, so if you've got the gift of eternal life, that's God's grace giving you eternal life when you don't deserve it. So now you've got these people who have eternal life, and now they suddenly have this pride. And they, and they think they're better than everybody else. And so then there's this flesh contest. You're thinking, well, why, why are you the leader of the little flock. Well, about me, I'm just, I'm better than I'm a better speaker than you are. I should be the leader. And you have this contest within. Look over in Galatians 5 and verse 15 because that's what was happening in the Galatian church. After they're saved, then they end up going into this legalism. And they're saying they're doing a comparison with their flesh. Look in verse 13, Galatians 5:13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now verse 15, Galatians 5, 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed, ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So you see here, you've got saved people, and among that believing remnant here in Galatians, they end up having going under the law, using their liberty as the occasion to the flesh. And they're saying, well, I'm a better speaker than you, so I should be the pastor of the church. I'm better at uh, collecting money, so I should be the treasurer, or, or whatever it is. You know, or look at me, I'm obeying the law better than you. And so there's this flesh contest, and instead of going out and proclaiming the gospel and getting people saved, they're biting and devouring one another. And if they're doing that, then there's nobody saved, uh, nobody coming in, because all it is is just a... It's a war, you know, you're biting and devouring each other, and the result there in Galatians 5.15 is that you be consumed one of another. And that's similar, Now I realize different situation in Galatians versus Hebrews, uh, but the result can be the same. Going back to Hebrews 12.15, 
looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So you're bitter over the fact that this person over here is a leader of the local church, and you're not. So then you try to overtake that, and now instead of the focus being sound doctrine for the little flock of Israel, and them having the light, remember they got to get in God's word, and as the deception program of Satan gets stronger, the darkness gets stronger, so they need that stronger light, and it says that the light, as we read earlier, would shine brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. But if Satan gets in the midst of that little flock and gets a root of bitterness there, then instead of you focusing on the doctrine and getting more of God's word in you so that you can combat the darkness, then what ends up happening is many are defiled. Many, the light doesn't shine brightly anymore because now you're looking at each other and saying, I should be the leader. I should be doing this. You aren't as good as me. And there's bitterness over what's going on. And the result, because the concentration is no longer on the doc sound doctrine, then many are defiled. Um, and so I wrote on your outline, the little flock needs to understand that they are all guilty before God. Look over in James 2, be because if it becomes a flesh contest, and you're saying, well, I obey the law better than you, so I should be a leader. Well, look at what it says over in James 2.10. James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So maybe there is a member of the little flock who is better at keeping the law than, say, a leader of the little flock. You know, look at Peter. He denied the Lord. Um, yep, he sinned at that time. He didn't obey the law, um, and here he is a leader. The other disciples, we don't have record of them denying the Lord like we do Peter, but yet the other disciples should say, well, I obey the law better than you, Peter, so I should be the leader. Because here we see in James 2.10, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So yeah, maybe the other disciples are better at keeping the law than Peter, but really, if you've just broken the law in one point, you're guilty of breaking the entire law. And since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then all members of the little flock, regardless of who is better at keeping the law and who isn't, they're all in need of God's grace. And so there shouldn't be this flesh contest going on and saying, I'm better, I should be in charge. You look at it and say, we're all sinners, we all need God's grace. Let's stop focusing on what we do in the flesh and let's focus on the kingdom being at hand. And we're going through the tribulation period. Let's get in the word and let that sound doctrine sink in. And if there's a sin, sure, we'll pray over it. He tells you over in James 5 to, uh, you know, in verse 15, the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So yeah, we'll go and we'll pray for you and you'll get healed and your sins will be forgiven. But we're not going to remove you from a leadership position because we're all guilty of the law. Let's forget about this contest, flesh contest. Just pray, you're healed, move on is the idea. So going back to Hebrews 12 then, verse 15, you got to look for that root of bitterness. And now in verse 16, he gives an example of such a root of bitterness that was in Israel. And this person is Esau. Remember that... Uh, Isaac yet Abraham, the promise given to Abraham in Genesis 12, and then he says, uh, and thy seed, I and Isaac shall thy seed, and thy son Isaac shall thy seed be called. So then Isaac, the promise goes from Abraham on to Isaac. And then Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. And Esau here is a type of unbelieving apostate Israel during the tribulation period. Hebrews 12:16 lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For we know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And the story of Esau, uh, he, sold, he, he had the birthright being the firstborn, and over in Genesis 25, you look over there and you can see what happened with him. And this is an important story because it relates the reason it's given here 
uh, in Genesis is specifically the best application of this is during the, the last three and a half years of the tribulation period when the mark of the beast is instituted. And we'll see that later here. But Genesis 25, verse 29. Genesis 25, 29. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware to him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Okay, now keep that in mind. And now look over in Revelation 13. Revelation 13 and verse 16. And this is a reference to the last half of the tribulation period. Revelation 13 and verse 16. And he, the he there, is the false prophet or the uh, anti-Holy Ghost. Going back to verse... 11, there's this other beast who's called the false prophet. Revelation 13, 16, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So basically it's saying that all people, it gives you the list there, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, all people have to receive a mark. And if they don't receive this mark, verse 17 says, they can't buy or sell. No participation in the economic system. Now go down to Revelation 14, verse 9. Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hands, so there's that mark. Verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of the God, uh, of God and the faith of Jesus. So we see here in Revelation 13, 16, the false prophet who's over the whole world makes a proclamation and says, you won't be able to buy or sell if you don't, if you, if you don't take the mark. You have to take the mark in order to buy or sell. And that includes food. And then in Revelation 14, 9 and 10 and 11, we find out that God makes a proclamation to the whole world because it's the, the, the angel follows with a loud voice. So he proclaims it to the whole world. And he says, if you take that mark, you're going to have eternity in the lake of fire. Now, let's apply this to Israel. God says Israel is his chosen people. He's chosen them above... The, let's look over in Deuteronomy 7 so you can see this. Deuteronomy 7, God is speaking to the nation of Israel. They have come out of Egypt and now they're in the wilderness at this time waiting to get into the promised land. And God tells them in Deuteronomy 7, 6, he says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. These are, in other words, the nation of Israel is God's people. Okay, now look over in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4.
and verse 22. Exodus 4, 22. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Okay. Okay, now let's think of Jacob and Esau. Esau is the firstborn. Esau being the firstborn son of Isaac, he has the birthright, meaning he is going to get the blessing. He gets a special blessing that the secondborn, or Jacob, doesn't get. So the special blessing is going to go to the firstborn, not to the secondborn. God proclaims that Israel is his firstborn son. He says, Deuteronomy 7, Thou art a special people above all the people of the face of the earth. Now the other people, the Gentiles, they can get the blessing too, just like Jacob. But there's a special blessing reserved for Israel because they're considered the firstborn. They have the birthright. That's the idea there. They have the birthright. Esau had the birthright. Esau, in Genesis 25, saw some food. And he says, Jacob says, sell me your birthright. I want the blessing. And Esau says, this birthright does me absolutely no good because I'm going to die if I don't eat. So he sells the birthright. And we read in Genesis 25, he said, it says that Esau despised his birthright. So then later on, when it comes time to give the blessing, Isaac is there. He gives the firstborn blessing to Jacob. Then Esau comes along and says, well, can't you reverse this? And he, he's, he wants, before he despised his birthright, because he wanted physical food. Now, when the blessing is actually given out by Isaac, Esau wants the big blessing that Jacob got. He doesn't get it. What does it say over in Hebrews 12, verse 17? For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. No matter how much Esau cried, no matter how much Esau begged Isaac to give him that firstborn blessing, he despised the firstborn blessing and sold it for food, so he does not get it. And this is a great parallel because what we read in Revelation 13, the false prophet says, you take my mark or you don't get to eat. And God says, you take his mark, you lose the blessing. You go to the lake of fire. And a fornicator or profane person such as Esau is going to say, what good does the kingdom do me if I starve to death? I will take the mark of the beast and I will get the food. Then, when Jesus comes back, he looks at those people and those people say, but I'm a Jew. I'm part of Israel. I'm that special people. I'm your firstborn son, God. Aren't you going to let your firstborn son come into the kingdom? And they're going to seek repentance carefully with tears, just like Esau did. And God's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Because when you were tried, you despised your birthright. You sold it for some pottage. You sold it in order to have some physical food. You said, I don't care about the kingdom because I'm going to die. Give me food. And you take the mark. By taking the mark, they sell their birthright. And so that's the warning here. He says there are going to be some people who don't have faith in God and His Word. When, God, when they proclaim peace and they say, Thy God reigneth, they're going to say, yeah, they believe it at first, but then when the mark of the beast comes along, they'll say, uh, no, I want to eat, so I'm going to despise my birthright. And the warning here is that when Esau came to that place where it was time for that blessing to be given out. He found no place of repentance, though he sought carefully with tears. And the idea here is you can't just 
God isn't going to forgive you at that point because He's already said in Revelation 14 that if you take the mark of the beast, you have your place in the lake of fire and you're going to burn there for all eternity. God is not going to repent of that or change His mind or go back to that. God is going to say, you made your choice. I made it clear. False prophet proclaimed, take the mark or you don't get food. And then I had an angel that proclaimed with a loud voice, take the mark and you'll go to the lake of fire. And you made the choice to obey the false prophet and not to obey God. Therefore, it's too late. And just like Esau seeks repentance carefully with tears and he does not get the firstborn blessing, so too... Israel, even if they believe the gospel of the kingdom, they can sell their birthright by taking the mark, and then they'll have tears and seek a place in the kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, and they won't get it. It doesn't matter how sorry they are at that point. When they sell their birthright by taking the mark, they're taking physical food over spiritual blessing, and that's an irrever irreversible action. You cannot reverse it. And so that's the comparison he makes. Now, now we're going to go to verse 18. Um, and he tells you in verse 18, he says, For ye are not come unto the mouth that might be touched. So he's saying, in other words, the reason why you won't get forgiveness in the kingdom or at Jesus' second coming is because you are not come unto the mouth might be touched. Uh, verses, verses 18 through 22 give you a description of God's giving of the law covenant to Moses and to the people of Israel back in Exodus 19 and 20. And then verse 23, I'm sorry, that, that goes down through verse 21, Exodus, or Hebrews 12, 18 through 21. And then verse 22, down through the end of the chapter, talks about the new covenant. So you got old covenant in verses 18 through 21, new covenant in verses 22 through 29. And the comparison, he says, in other words, verses 16 and 17 says Esau didn't get repentance, though he saw it carefully with tears. He doesn't get the firstborn blessing. And the author of Hebrews is saying, you're in that position. And if you take the mark of the beast... There is no forgiveness. That's the unpardonable sin. There is no forgiveness if you do that. Why is there no forgiveness? He says in verse 18, For ye are not come unto the mouth that might be touched. You're not under the old covenant. You're not judged under the old covenant here. But rather, verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion. New covenant. So your judgment is not going to be what you see under the old covenant. The judgment is based upon the provisions of the new covenant. And under the new covenant, there is no place of forgiveness for the mark of the beast. Under the old covenant, there is. And so we're going to look at verses 18 through 21 now. The reason I bring that up is because when people read verses 18 through 21, what they do is they take it out of context and they say, well, you see, God was a very vengeful, hating God back in the Old Testament and he was awesome and fearful and all these bad things happened under the law covenant but under grace under the new covenant and the New Testament God is a loving caring compassionate God and instead of zapping you dead he will give you eternal life and and that's what they tell you but the context of this is actually the opposite of that and that's what we're going to see. And so that's why we're going to spend some time in verses 18 through 21 so you can see that really, he, in other words, he's saying the reason, he's saying there is forgiveness. If you're in the situation of Esau and you sell your birthright, there is forgiveness in the situation of verses 18 through 21, Old Covenant. But there is no forgiveness in the situation of verses 22 through 29, New Covenant. It's the opposite of what Christianity teaches you. And we're going to see that as we go through it. So let's read verses 18 uh, through 21. And then I'll show you what I mean by that. So verses 18 through 21 isn't a picture of destruction. 
It's a picture of God's mercy. Verses 20 through 29 is not a picture of God's grace. It's a picture of God's judgment. Look at the result in verse 29 of the new covenant. It says, our God is a consuming fire. That's judgment. God is going to consume them for taking the mark of the beast. Okay, so verses 18 through 21, this is a picture of God's mercy. It's not the vengeful, hateful God of the Old Testament. It's mercy, and we're going to see that. Verse 18, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated, that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. You read those verses and you think, oh, that's bad news. You know, a beast comes up, they die, touch the mountain, they die. This sight is so terrible. Moses says, I exceedingly fear and quake. The people say, God, don't speak to us anymore. We tremble. We can't even handle your words. Please don't speak to us anymore. That all sounds bad, but actually, it's God's mercy. The reason is because even though, I mean, that's an awesome, terrible, fearful sight. The fact is, by giving the law, God did not destroy them. And they were subject to God's destruction based upon their unbelief coming out of Egypt. So let's see that. So let's go over to, first off, let's look in Exodus 19, and we'll see this is what it's quoting, what Hebrews 12 is talking about is the situation of Moses and Mount Sinai uh, coming out of Egypt here. Exodus 19, verse 16. So this is the giving of the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law Covenant. Exodus 19, 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. See, it's a scary thing. They're trembling and they stood at the nether part of the mountain. They get as far away as they can uh, here. Verse 18, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. I mean, this is an awesome sight. God himself has come down on earth such that the mountain is quaking. The reason it's quaking is because it's under the curse of sin. And here's a holy God upon a sin-cursed mountain. So the mountain quakes. The people under sin, they're quaking, they're trembling. They stand as far away as they can. And verse 19, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. So this all sounds terrible. Now I go down to chapter 20, verse 18. We'll continue. He gives the Ten Commandments, but now after the giving of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. So they're afraid of what God's saying. They're saying, God's going to kill us. You speak to us, Moses. God's going to kill us. But look at what Moses says in the next verse, Exodus 20, 20. Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. In other words, God has not come to kill you. He's come in grace. What he's done is he's given a set of laws for them to obey so that they will not die. Now, go back now to chapter 15. Because you got to see what led to this point. Why did God do this? So in Exodus 14, of course, before that, you've got the ten plagues. And then God leads them out. In Exodus 14, you've got the parting of the Red Sea. Israel crosses on dry ground. They come through. Then Exodus 15, they sing the song.